Nick Alexander. I'm the forest health specialist with the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. Um, a, a lot of what I do with the DFFM revolves around insect and disease identification and management. And part of that, one of the programs that we manage and run is our Mediterranean Pine and Graver Monitoring Program. And then Irene, I, I don't know if you want to go ahead and give a little intro yourself before I actually lead into everything. Um, sure. So I'm a research technician um, at the University of Arizona, and I've been I started working for at the monitoring program since 2020. <laughs> Which you'll hear from her a lot throughout this presentation. <laughs> Okay, so um, just a little outline of what we're going to go over um, for this quick presentation. We're just going to review the background of the Mediterranean Pine Engraver, um, or MPE, what it is and why it's important. We'll also go over um, the program itself, including how we do our trap collect collections, sorting the samples that we do collect, and then we'll also review the results from 2019, 2020, and 2021 as well. And we'll also discuss a couple of ways that maybe we can utilize the data after the trapping season is completed. Um, and lastly, we'd like to know if there's any interest in volunteering for our program for the 2022 trapping season. All right, so to begin, the Mediterranean Pine and Griever um, or Orthotomicus erosus, um, MPE, was first discovered in the Phoenix metro area in 2018. Upon its discovery, the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management posted a pest alert online on our website, letting people know that this new non-native invasive urban pest was present. This bark beetle has a history of causing extensive mortality in pines of its native range, um, but here in the United States, this bark beetle appears to utilize any tree in the genus Pinus, uh, but it does have potential interactions with closely re related genera um, that those interactions are still unclear at this point. Um, all right, so what is MPE? Hey, so MPE is an invasive bark beetle that is mostly a pest in urban areas in the US. Um, they're tiny beetles about three millimeters long and their most noticeable feature is an inward curved backside with four spines on each side. It was first found in California in 2004 in the Southern Central Valley, mainly on um, ornamental pines in urban areas, but it is predicted that they arrived about three years earlier. It most likely came on cargo coming from its native range, and as far as we know, it is only established in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, and it was first found in Phoenix in 2018. So they're native in the Mediterranean, Middle East, Central Asia, and China. And in their native range, they attack many pine species as well as um, in their well-documented pests causing tree mortality. So in North America so far, most of the infestations have been reported in planted Mediterranean and other non-native pines such as Aleppo and Canary Island. So it's considered a secondary pest, which infests broken branches, recently fallen trees, and stressed trees. Okay. So um, let's look at their cycle. It starts with adult male beetles. They first locate um, host trees and then tunnel into the bark. In the top photo, you can see an entry hole by an MPE, and the photo next to it shows um, an MPE tunneling in the bark. So using pheromones, they attract females, but also other males to the tree. So usually a male will mate with multiple females, at least two. And after mating, females will travel away from the male in opposite directions, forming tunnels called galleries to lay eggs. One female can lay from 26 to 75 eggs. You can see um, multiple MP galleries in the photo to the right. So after the larvae hatch from their eggs, they feed in the phloem and complete their development within a couple of months, depending on the temperature. 
So they leave the galleries forming exit holes in the bark. You can see many exit holes in the photo to the left. And so newly developed adults can attack new trees or a different location of the same tree. So there are two to four generations per year in most of the native and introduced areas, depending on the temperature. But it has been predicted to have up to seven generations per year in ideal conditions. The number of generations in Arizona and California is not yet known. Um, so flight activity is around March to September, but it can be longer and again, depending on the temperature. So MPE is important because it's um, of its broad host range. They can attack many different species of pine trees in urban areas and can potentially move into our native forests. Large populations of MPE can overwhelm and kill already stressed trees. And with pheromones, they can attract other MPE to attack vulnerable hosts. Um, the direct feeding of adults and larvae can disrupt water nutrient transport in the bark. And beetles may also carry fungal pathogens on their body, which can further weaken the tree. So for example, in South Africa, MPE is known to carry blue stain fungus affecting Monterey and maritime pines. Okay, next. So it can be difficult to detect an NP infestation until the tree is dying, but there are a few signs that may indicate infestation. In the picture on the left, you can see a pine tree with discolored um, dry needles, mainly at the top. This is one sign of a potential MP infestation. Since MP, like many other pine engravers, attack at the top of the tree first and then work their way down. So another sign is small holes on the surface of the bark from MP entering or exiting the bark. The middle picture shows red boring dust coming out of an MP entrance hole. So the red boring dust is a, a mixture of beetle excretion and bark. So if you scrape off the bark where the holes are, you may, you may be able to see galleries like in the picture on the right. You can see their vertical and horizontal tunnels. So the larvae feed in horizontal lines away from the parent's vertical gallery. However, these signs can also be caused by other factors such as water stress and attacks from other insects. So once there's a potential infestation, it is good to monitor the extent through insect traps. So Ali will now introduce the MP monitoring program in the Phoenix area. All right, so thank you, Irene. Yeah, now that we have a better understanding of the MPE's biology and the signs and symptoms of their infestation, we can go over um, our monitoring program for this test. So to begin, the MPE monitoring program was established in 2018, immediately following that discovery of, it, of its presence here in the Valley. Uh, this program was developed to help determine the severity of MPE's infestation also help determine the extent of MPE's established, uh, yeah, establishment <laughs> and also their population fluctuations. Um, we also wanted to try to determine if their biology might be different here in Arizona than in their native habitat. So for example, do our mild winters allow for longer flight seasons, thus allowing for more generations per year? Uh, lastly, this program will help provide management strategies to the public and other interested agencies. And as previously mentioned, this program was started in 2018, but the traps that were placed that year, uh, they were placed in different locations um, and, and some of the traps were only left in one location for a few weeks at a time. So not until really 2019 did the program develop some standards to keep the traps in single locations for longer periods of time, which really allowed us to, to better track the data and be able to compare that data year to year. Um, because of how frequently those traps were moved we, in 2018, we can't really compare the 2018 data to 2019, 2020, and 2021. So uh, when we move forward and we focus on uh, the data from the previous years, we're really going to be focusing on that 2019, 2020, and then last summer of 2021 as well. So in 2019, uh, 15 traps were placed around the northeast part of the Phoenix metro area. So 
kind of closer to Paradise Valley, the Scottsdale area. So the, the map here is showing where those first initial traps were placed um, in that, that first year. So those 15 traps. And then you'll notice too at the very bottom of the map that those were actually APHIS sites, but we, we still kept track of, of where they had their sites as well. Uh, but by 2020, we added additional traps. So we added another 15 traps, placing a total of 30 traps around the Phoenix Metro. So you can see we, we definitely spread those traps out a little bit more to try to capture more areas and really determine the extent of their spread. But by 2021, we expanded out the trapping even more. So we still placed 30 traps, but we spread them out even more widely throughout the valley. So again, really trying to determine how widespread they are throughout the valley um, to give us a better idea of, of how established they are here. Uh, the only reason any of the trap locations would move throughout the season would be if there was vandalism or theft or some kind of tampering with the trap. So we, we really tried to make sure that all the traps stay in the same location for the, the whole that whole trapping season. So those whole 20 weeks. Um, again, if, if anything happened, uh, it was just due to vandalism or um, tampering with the traps. Okay, so uh, on this map, you'll notice there's also a bunch of, of different associated colors going on. You've got orange, blue, and purple. And so last summer, we, we divvied up based off of the volunteers and the sites that they were able to help with. So all the trap sites that the volunteers picked to collect from were in purple. And then um, between Lori Ann, myself, um, Irene, and another DFFM coworker, we split up the remaining blue and orange sites between us um, for those, those 20 weeks as well. And then for this season, 2022, uh, it's, it's exactly the same as last season. So we're trying to keep the traps in the same locations so that um, if volunteers are wanting to possibly go to some of the same trap sites, you know, that they'll be in the same location. So um, right now you can see I have all of the traps are um, labeled in orange, just meaning we haven't delegated any of those traps to anyone at this point. But I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we haven't moved anything for this season. So we're hoping to keep them the same as last year, just for the, the ease of, of hopefully getting more volunteers to help us. <laughs> All right, so um, I will let Irene now go ahead and review some specifics of how we actually do the MPE trapping. There we go. So to monitor, we use a multi-funnel multi trap, which typically consists of 12 funnels and has a cup attached to the bottom. So you can see in the picture, the trap starts with a lid at the top so no debris can fall in and then continues with black funnels attached to each other and a white cup at the bottom. So we fill this cup with antifreeze to capture the beetles. So to attract MPEs um, to our traps, we use a total of three different lures. Two of the lures are synthetic versions of the pheromones produced by the male. And the third lore is alpha pining, which imitates the odors given off by a stress tree. So adult and P male and females are attracted to the lures and fly to the trap, then bump into the trap and fall down the funnels into the cup and, uh, and then are immobilized by the antifreeze. So then once a week, we service the traps and collect the contents in the cup. Okay. So all the weekly collections are sorted in the lab and using a microscope MP is identified and the total is recorded for each location and week. Um, the sorted beetles are stored in vials, which um, filled with ethanol for preservation. And the total count for some locations can be as high as a few thousand per trap during um, the peak in the summer. So, um, you can see the bio at the top holds about a thousand MPE. And we also determine the sex of MPE. So the left picture shows a male and the picture after shows a female. They can be um, mainly distinguished by their spines, which are more prominent on the male than the female. And sometimes we find other bark beetles that can be confused with MPE. So one example is the native bark beetle, um, also a pine engraver called six spine ips shown um, in the right picture. 
Um, as the name suggests, it has six spines and it's a little larger than MPE. So the total MPE counts for each weekend trap is recorded and available to public, which will be explained later. Okay, so like Ali mentioned, um, we have 30 traps that we service every week during the monitoring season. And servicing the traps consists of trap maintenance, um, where we make sure the trap and cup lures are all in place. Um, and if needed, the lures are replaced. Then we collect the contents in the cup and we record observations such as um, trap uh, condition. And we also make an estimated guess of the um, amount of MPE in each trap so we can make it immediately available to the public. So it usually takes a two person team to collect them all in one week, which um, each service 15 traps, 15 in the west, which is in red on the map, and 15 in the east, which is in blue. Um, so servicing 15 traps almost takes about one work day. Yeah, and so um, as, as Irene just mentioned, so we previously for 2020, when she and I was splitting the traps between the two of us, um, and she was taking the west side and I would take the east side or vice versa, or if we had someone help us, it, it did take a, basically a full day to be able to do those 15 traps. Mm -hmm. So by 2021, when we expanded the traps out even more, um, it started to take up even more time to be able to collect from the traps, just the drive time to get from trap to trap um, increased by, by a lot from 2020 to 2021. Um, and, and so because of that expansion, uh, you know, we did wind up going to, to different cities. Again, we were really trying to spread those traps out to really get a good idea of how widespread MPE was in the Valley. So we did wind up putting traps in, in Mesa, Chandler, Gilbert, Tempe, Scottsdale, and Peoria. Uh, what else is on there? Oh, and Goodyear and, and Glendale. So we, we really did uh, spread those traps out even more. So again, just kind of really reiterating that it was, it was a lot to maintain or attempt to maintain between two people. So being able to have some help in there. Um, and uh, again, those, the master naturalist help last year, we actually have some of the stats here at the bottom. Um, they were able to help us by saving us over 450 hours um, of time over those 24 weeks that they helped collect. And, and with that amount of time, that wound up saving us over $23,000. So having the citizen scientists, you know, like the master naturalists and, and others be able to help us with this has been, you know, a, a, just a tremendous help. I, I mean, I can't even say thank you enough time or, or I, I can't do enough to tell the master naturalists how thankful we are for the support that they gave us last year. Um, so again, with that said, moving into the uh, 2020 trapping season, we, we are not planning on changing the location of those traps for, for the, this year. Um, but uh, like I said, so uh, we haven't delegated out where those traps or who will be visiting those traps or anything like that. Once we have a second meeting and we determine who's interested in volunteering and helping us, with this 2022 season, we'll have a, another training um, or maybe another presentation or maybe a field day. We haven't figured out how we'll do the second event yet, but uh, some, some event where we can actually work and meet with the volunteers who are interested and figure out, you know, what traps they might be willing to visit, what weeks they might be willing to visit, you know, can they commit to all 20 weeks? Maybe they can only commit to two weeks, um, but again, that would be any of the 30 traps that anyone is interested in helping with. Um, and that would include that weekly trap collection. So the trap maintenance, the, the content collections, and then also recording those field observations um, as, as Irene also mentioned. Um, and you know, we'll, we wanna work with you guys to make this as easy as possible um, for anyone that helps. So whether, you know, the, the trap collections that you get, if you're in the Phoenix, uh, metro area and you want to bring those collections to the SFO or um, the, the Phoenix office, our, our uh, main office in downtown Phoenix, or if you would rather go um, take the supplies to Tucson if you are in Tucson, um, you know, I know Irene and Lorianne are available to be able to help take those collections off folks' hands. So we really want to try to make this 
as as easy um, for for anyone that volunteers as we can. Um, yes. So again, just uh, nothing has been determined for the 2022 season. So all trap sites are available for anyone at this rate. <laughs> okay. So um, earlier, Irene had mentioned that we try to make our data available to the public immediately. And so we do that using a field app on our phones. Um, it's an ArcGIS online application called Field Maps. And it is an app that you just download on your phone and you would put the data into it every time you collect from the trap. So it would be per trap site. And as soon as you submit that data, it immediately goes to our online dashboard. So this is a public facing web page that shows our real time data as we're collecting it in the field. Um, and that is by DFFM employees or any volunteers who decide to help us with some of the trapping this season. So we, we worked with our GIS coordinator to create this dashboard because we really wanted it to have some kind of an interactive way that um, homeowners or municipalities or really anyone with an interest in MPE could see where all the trap locations are, uh, where what the traps are actually catching. Um, so you can click on individual trap sites um, if you wanted to look at one location specifically to see what was caught there, um, or it just kind of gives you a good overall view of what has been caught around the valley. And then it also shows nice comparisons um, between 2019, 2020, and 2021. So it's just a nice way to kind of show the data that we're getting. And again, in that real time um, way, so that as soon as we're in the field and we're making those updates, um, anyone that's interested can, can see those updates as well. Um, and as I had mentioned, we do use an app called um, Field Maps. So that's something that, again, if, if people are interested in volunteering for this, we will have a whole nother um, meeting training where we'll go over um, the expectations of you know, how to help and, and get involved with the volunteer process. And that'll go over using that, that application and everything as well. Um, so with that, part of the data that is recorded is we give those instantaneous ratings. So Irene had mentioned we give our best guess in the field of what we think the trap cups contain. So we give the ratings either an, an absent, which would mean there's no beetles that were caught, um, or we give it a rating of low, which is less than 100 beetles. Moderate is between 100 to 500 beetles, and then high is 500 to 1,000 and very high would be over a thousand beetles. Um, so that's kind of your, our quick guess. And, and we don't expect anyone to be spot on when you're giving a guess. It, again, it is just a guesstimate. Um, and after Irene does the official counting, she updates that on this dashboard as well. So even though we have that initial guess, then we will have you know some time following, whether it's a week or maybe two weeks after that, Irene will be able to provide the, the actual count. And that will show on the dashboard as well. Okay, so here's a, a table showing our trap counts from 2019, 2020, and 2021. And these are the actual numbers of the counted beetles per trapping season. And it's also showing their um, peak flights as well. So meaning we trap the most beetles in either June or July of those trapping seasons. And you can see, I mean, that comparatively, you know, 2019, we had a pretty severe, I'd say kind of an outbreak that year. I mean, just following some of the drought and everything like that, um, the population seemed to be pretty high. And, and since then it kind of sprang back up last season. And now that we have a dry winter this year, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit more of an increase again going into this summer. Um, I guess you never know what the monsoon season might bring. So maybe things could, could dampen down a little bit, but I think we might see some high numbers at the beginning of the trapping season. Um, and then the maps below the, the table are just kind of showing again that, that spread and uh, they're what we call heat maps. So showing where the highest concentrations of those beetles are being found. And, we have noticed that since 2019, we do consistently find our highest um, concentrations of beetles in still that kind of more northeastern part of the, the valley there. Um, so again, it's just kind of that 
so I think Christie Cove Park and Serrano Park, um, those are a few of some of our highest areas. So those that has been consistent over the last three years is the highest um, concentrations of MPE there. All right, back to Irene. <laughs> Okay, so the Tucson monitoring last year showed that MP is present in this area, although in small numbers. Um, a total of 147 MP were trapped from April to September, and we found MP in five out of the 10 locations, mainly in the northwestern area. So in the map, the red markers represent where MP was trapped. So mainly in the in the central area, we would get like at least one or two beetles per week, but um, the northern had a little bit of higher numbers. So before um, 2021, there has been no known record of MPE being present in Tucson, although there have been past monitoring projects. So due to its presence, um, the FFM made a health alert announcing that MP is now present in Tucson. Thanks, Irene. Um, so yeah, just um, now that we kind of went over the, the actual trapping program, I kind of wanted to just give a little bit of feedback of what can we do with all this data? So, you know, what as the as you citizen scientists, you know, what are you really helping us by, by collecting this data? Um, you know, and, and helping with this monitoring program. And so I just kind of wanted to go over a couple of things of, of, about possible management techniques for MPE. Um, and, and with that said, un unfortunately, at this time, there, there isn't much known about MPE in our forests. So being able to provide um, great management, management techniques is just not something we can do quite yet. Um, so right now, um, you know, really what we can try to tell most people is that prevention is your, your best option, meaning trying to do something before the beetles are actually attacking your trees. So this could include proper watering and maintenance of your tree's health and their vigor. So just ensuring that you are properly watering your trees, that you're, you're doing it enough during the right times of the year, um, you know, and whether it's times of drought or intense heat but making sure they're getting the right amount of water that they need during the right time of the year. Um, and also making sure, especially with Mediterranean pines, that we're not overwatering them. Mediterranean pines don't like having wet feet, so we definitely want to make sure we're, we're watering them kind of just, just right. <laughs> and um, also prevention can kind of include that the proper care and maintenance of your tree, uh, meaning proper pruning. So making sure that you're pruning during the right time of year and that you're making good, clean, proper pruning cuts because poor pruning can lead to stress. And as we know, beetles prefer stressed trees and stressed trees are just more susceptible to bark beetle attack. Other management options include good sanitation methods. So this would mean ensuring MPE infested trees are removed or felled and are taken off site and no debris or other pine material is left near healthy pines, um, as this can attract more MPE to the area. Good sanitation also includes proper disposal of that debris. So that would be chipping, burning, or debarking all of that freshly cut pine um, and any actively infested pines as well. Um, so by, by chipping, burning, or debarking, uh, we're, we're not leaving the adults or larvae with an opportunity to leave and infest new pines. Um, and along the same lines as proper sanitation is um, outreach and education about moving firewood. So we do not want people moving pine firewood around that can either attract beetles to a new area or transfer actively infested wood to new locations where MPE can, can leave that firewood and infest other trees nearby. Um, lastly, early detection. So being aware of what is going on in your area can be um, can help you be more cautious and follow the examples that I just listed about preventative management. So really, from the data we are collecting right now, we're, we're allowing homeowners to act preventatively. So by telling homeowners that, yes, you have MPE in your area, we can help provide them with these preventative management techniques. 
Um, otherwise, what we what we really need is more research on other management options. But until we get to that point, we can continue monitoring to continue to provide this useful data about their life cycle in Arizona, as well as where they're at. Um, so the so the monitoring in 2022. Oh, there we go. What we can do. Okay, so again, with the con continuation of the program in Phoenix this year, we are asking for your help again. Um, we're seeking uh, volunteers to help us as uh, citizen scientists that help collect from the traps on a weekly basis starting in May. So one individual might help us with three to five traps, all depending on the volunteer's availability and location of the traps. So along with collections, volunteers will record their findings for each trap and occasionally help with trap maintenance, such as replacing the, the lures. Um, so we're asking at least a minimum of five to seven, but if more would like to help, um, that would be great. Volunteers need to have a driver's license in the vehicle. And for those who are interested in helping us, um, we will provide training, um, I believe maybe in April. So um, we'll cover trap maintenance and how to collect from the traps, as well as recording observations, which how Ali mentioned earlier this year, the volunteers have the option of using a field map app that makes field recordings easier. Um, so last year's help went well, and we're hoping for your support once again. Thank you, Eileen. Um, so yeah, just a very quick little summary of, of what we just went over. Uh, MP is an invasive bark beetle that attacks our urban pines. It's found throughout the Southwest. Um, our monitoring program began after the beetle was found in 2018. This monitoring program is helping us determine MP's population, extent of their presence, and determine if their biology might be different in Arizona and also help implement future management techniques. All the data collected from this program is publicized on our public dashboard and made available um, to the public in real time. With the expansion of the program last year, again, we would, would really greatly appreciate any help that the volunteers could provide over that 20 week collection period. All right, so that is all we have. Um, so I just wanna thank everyone again for, for being here and for your support. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to Laurieann and stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks. So I know we have a couple of folks on the call, Kathy and Kelly for sure that helped us last year. And I wanted to offer you all an opportunity to maybe say a little bit about what you did and, and how you participated in the program and how often you did it. Um, because we are, you know, going to share this with the rest of the, the master naturalists. Not all of them are on the call today, but uh, I think that would give people a better sense of, you know, what what it was and how it was, you know, how it was for you, if it was beneficial or fun. Uh, and if there's other things that you wanted to know based on your experience, we can answer those questions. So um, Kelly, would you like to go first and just say a, a little bit about what you did and, and how it was? Sure. So I know Kathy helped out a lot, but I only helped out in 2021, I think three or four times. Um, so it's kind of up to you, like what you're, you know, available to do. Um, so that was really nice, um, the flexibility of that. Um, I was also, so I'm in Tucson, so um, I was able to work with Lorianne and Irene to like get the supplies and drop off the bugs and <laughs> um, yeah. So I think the main, you know, time usage, usage of your time is uh, just driving. So I just like got my podcasts, got my music <laughs> all ready to go. Um, and yeah, the trap checking itself, once you like learn how to do it, it's super easy, super quick. Um, you get antifreeze on your hands, but you know, you just bring um, uh, like wipes with you, no problem. It's uh, very, very doable. Um, and I did get asked like by somebody walking by one time, just like what the heck this is all about. Um, and that was really fun. I've, you know, I had been doing it like a few times by then. So I felt good, you know, like talking about it and explaining like why this is a problem and, um, 
yeah so and that's kind of a highlight when that happens is like you get to like be an educator um and have that uh sort of like behind you like you can kind of explain you know how it works and all that stuff so um yeah um it's it was really fun and like i said really like self-directed and flexible um and yeah i plan to keep keep doing it so yeah yeah, thanks for sharing your perspective. I think that is important too, that, you know, even though you couldn't do a, a ton because you're working and you're in Tucson, you still were able to pitch in and do it a few times. And I mean, that was still really, really helpful, especially when some of the folks maybe that are in Phoenix couldn't get to them that week and, and that kind of thing. So it's just really helpful to have people that are able to plug in in different like timeframes and ways. So thank you. Kathy, do you want to go next and say a little bit about what yeah. you Gwen did? Yeah, sure. We, um, so my daughter and I went, um, gosh, I think we did just about every week um, throughout the whole period, plus some additional um, ones. I don't know the what, when was that? A few months ago. And um, we covered some other people's traps when they were out of town. Um, we had a lot of fun. The driving definitely is the longest part of it. Um, I think it took us four hours to do our traps. Um, we did get asked, actually, we, we kind of made friends with the guy at Scottsdale Stadium. Um, cause he, you know, was like, what are y'all doing here? And so we talked to him a few times and then he would come over and chat us up. So, um, yeah, we actually enjoyed just, again, like kind of being out in nature and seeing different things. Um, also in the traps, you'll find some cool stuff. Um, so we kind of like to see what else was going to pop up besides the beetles. Um, and so we had like a really cool sphinx moth. I think it was a sphinx moth. Um, and it was like huge. Um, so anyway, we really enjoyed it. We're looking forward to it again. Um, you know, it was just I don't know, just fun and exciting and glad to help. Yeah, that's great. I'm so grateful to you guys too, because you did do a lot of that. And I know Gwen had a, a really good time learning how to do science, right? I mean, that was wonderful. Oh yeah, yeah. My daughter, projects. by the way, those that don't know, uh, my daughter Gwen, we homeschool. So they literally go everywhere with me um, and she's 16. There she is. <laughs> Wait, hi. <laughs> hi and you guys designed that um beetle brigade logo for us too which we all got shirts so if you want to help us and that's something you're interested in we have some shirts for you too to wear um i think they get a lot of a lot of traffic when we wear those out in the field too <laughs> so and kelly's saying yeah there's hundreds of sphinx moth caterpillars all over the park so there's a lot of other things to, to look at, just like um, Kathy said in the cup, there's some interesting things that you might see that you might not see otherwise, so. Yeah, and we also, I kind of like use the opportunity to do some other projects too. So like we collected trash while we were out. We um, we did, we have the ecoflora up here in Phoenix. So like every month there's a different challenge. So, you know, while we were out, we were taking pictures of plants or bugs or whatever else for other community science. So, you know, yeah. We got a lot done. You got a lot done. It was good. It was very good. And I think, um, it, well, I guess the other thing to note is that we do, we did have the traps out all year in, in five places, not all 30 places, but five locations. We kept them out over the winter. I can't remember if you guys said that. You probably did. Um, yeah, I, I think I might have forgotten that part is, yeah, so part of the, the monitoring is that we do leave five traps out for the entire year just to continue to keep an eye on, you know, if they are, you know, emerging maybe in the fall or winter when we wouldn't expect them to. So that is part of it as well. Thanks, yeah. Lorian. Sure. And this was part of a grant that you all had, and this is the last year of the grant. So this is the last year we'll be doing this, um, which isn't to say that maybe there wouldn't be another opportunity in the future. Um, but I don't know, Ali, do you want to say anything about uh, APHIS and why they might have been interested in the data and who they are? Yeah, um, well, I, 
APHIS, um, they were interested initially just in general when it comes to non-native invasives, you know, wood borers and bark beetles, they're also monitoring. So they do their own trapping as well. And they typically pick ports of entry um, or, you know, a lot of the times like railroads and stuff like that, just trying to keep an eye on any new introductions um, that we might have in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that was kind of how APHIS initially got involved. And APHIS is actually still a part of our program because they supply us with the traps themselves. And they also supply us with some of the lures. Um, so they are involved in this whole process. And we do keep them informed on the numbers that we are collecting. And then also just the track locations of where we're finding all of this. So APHIS is also keeping track of, of all of this data as well. And I put the link to the general APHIS website uh, in the chat box a, a little bit ago when Ali first mentioned it. Oh. So if you wanted to pop back up there and grab it and just take a look at some of the, the work that they do, it describes a little bit more about that agency, federal agency that monitors um, stuff for agriculture. Uh, yeah, so good. And, you know, the, the thing that I will say is that as the person who's the urban forestry specialist, we definitely get a lot of questions about the pine trees because they're, they're big, they're in Tucson, they're in Phoenix, and they're in decline from the drought. And so people want to know what's wrong with their tree. Um, Allie and I just did a nice walkthrough of a, a neighborhood association on Friday where they had a bunch of questions about trees. And um, it's really, it's kind of a risk if the trees are big and not healthy and they're near property or people. And uh, many of them are reaching the end of their, their urban lifespan, which isn't necessarily as long as it would be if you found a tree somewhere in, in a natural habitat in a forest. So um, keeping track of, of what's going on with those trees and, and just monitoring them is really helpful for homeowners too, I think. So um, there's a chance that people, if you're helping with this project might ask you about that as well, because. That's often the first thing people ask me is, oh, I have a I have a pine tree in my yard and it doesn't look very good. Do you think it has beetles in it? And so just being able to describe, you know, the biology of the tree and how the process works and the fact that it's not necessarily the beetles that are damaging the tree, but the tree is already stressed and that makes it more attractive to the beetles is another little naturalist nugget that you can provide to people in the field. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. they if they want to know more about it so and that's yeah. a, I mean a great point like Laurieann you're saying I mean the outreach and education part of this is a huge component and you guys are helping us with that as well by making those contacts you know and spreading just the knowledge of, of what is going on with MPE so again you know helping in that way as well yeah and I did want to point out Danielle had a question about the where the, the traps are on the trees um, I don't, Danielle, if you want to elaborate on that, you can, or I can just reiterate what we had in the chat box there, but it's a few. Um, so I know you mentioned that, well, then, but then you explained it a little bit, Lorian. So like you mentioned at one point that it starts at the top of the tree. Is that where the eggs, where do the eggs like get laid? Where are the eggs laid is, I guess my first question. Irene, do you want to take it or I can answer it too? <laughs> yeah, so generally these beetles start attacking at the top, oh, but then um, but then once they're they're established, you can see in the lore. So I don't know if Ali has seen, but sometimes some of the trees you could see on the branches already, like these holes, or sometimes even a, a little bit at the base. But um, but yeah, once this is it's established there's holes like throughout the tree. Wow. Um, but the eggs are laid right um, in the bark. So on in the flow on. So where the bark is, and then there's another layer. So in that flow on area is where the galleries are formed. Okay, I think that's what my question was. So if it starts at the top and then there's the holes, you know, get all in the trees, but the funnels are at the bottom, it, but then it already makes it kind of too late to kind of, yeah, so and and to kind of answer your question with with probably more detail than you want. Uh, <laughs> um, so the the first thing is that part of the reason the beetles start at the top down is that um, orthotomicus they they prefer smaller diameter trees or smaller diameter portions of the tree. So they begin by attacking at the top and they kind of working their way down. And like Irene mentioned, you might start seeing some of the branches going because they're then moving from the main part of the tree into the branches as well. 
Um, so even though the beetles that might be in the top of the tree and we're placing our traps on the bottom, those adults will still wind up finding those traps, but we're not trapping for the purpose of killing the beetles. Um, we're trapping for the purpose of just knowing that they're there. Um, so even though we're putting a trap, you know, close to trees that are already declining, we know we're not going to help those trees. We know that we're just basically trapping the beetles that are leaving those trees to see, you know, what's how how significant the infestation is in that area. So um, you can do trapping um, as as possibly a management technique. You know, if you think you might have a tree that is in a susceptible area, you know, there are options to, to trap for the purpose of actually catching the beetles to kill them, but that's not um, the purpose of our trapping program. Oh, okay. Okay. I understand. Very good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Good. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions or anything you want to share or say about the project? Pete, I've got a question. Yes, I do. So awesome. we have the champion Aleppo pine tree here in Tucson that we take care of. It's, it's a high value tree. Part of when I went to the conference and I got to listen to Ali speak, um, I'm a certified arborist and my job is to go out and not only diagnose trees and, and catch things, I also have to cut them down. That's the worst part of my job. And I see, you know, when I was on my way to meet uh, Nicole Gillette at the uh, Reed Park today, um, I counted six dead pines. Whether they have the beetles in them or not, I can't tell, but, you know, um, we want to work in an integrated pest management system. So that's, that's my involvement with them. And so our company is willing to invest time and money to monitor here in Tucson. So I placed the traps that Ali gave me uh, 1.2 miles away from that tree. Is that going to, I know we don't want to attract the, the beetles to a host tree, trying to protect this tree and trying to protect the trees in our city. I'm tired of taking them down. My question is how far do they fly and how far away from a tree that you want to protect should you place your traps? Yeah, um, you know, great question. Um, so the, the beetles, for one, they're, they're not great flyers. So they are like, you know, little bricks or little refrigerators with wings. You know, they're not super aerodynamic. So they aren't meant to, you know, they just don't fly very far in general. They definitely uh, fly shorter distances and often, you know, they can even just land on a host and taste test it to figure out if it's a tree that they're interested in, you know, they might not even know immediately what they're looking for. Um, so I, there's a, been a lot of research to try to figure out how far they can fly. And there's so much variation between the different species, um, you know, and, and the beetles can get caught in uh, like wind, or they can get, you know, go pretty high up into the sky and get caught in like jet streams and stuff like that. So they have been known to, like in those cases, they can travel pretty far. But when it's just themselves flying, they, I think the max that they really look at is, is like one to two miles, like for an individual to make its like own trek to a tree. So they're, again, they're really not flying very far. And more often than not, it's people that are vectoring them. So if you see new areas of infestation, it's more likely that they didn't fly there. It's more likely that something was brought to the area and then they were able to leave and then begin infesting in that area. Um, so with that said, based on you know, the champion tree and its location, and the fact that we already did trap some MPE you know, kind of north of that Reed Park area, you know, I, I think it'd be safe to say that we know MPE is already around there. And if you're placing your traps over a mile away from the champion tree, which you guys are maintaining, so you're already properly watering it, you're properly pruning it, so you're keeping its health and vigor, you know, as, as high and healthy as you possibly can. So, you know, even if you place those traps again, one to two miles away, 
they're not going to be attracted to that that healthy tree. You know, they're going to be looking for those stressed ones that are, you know, next to the street and maybe had some roots removed or roots damaged by sidewalk or they had their water turned off for the last two years. So things like that. So I, I definitely don't think you need to worry about your traps attracting the beetles to the champion tree. Um, you know, again, because of how healthy that tree is, you know, what you guys are doing to maintain it, it's, it's at a much lower risk of infestation. <laughs> awesome. Great question and great answer. Thank you. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Well, anybody else have any questions or comments or concerns? I know, Ali, uh, the one thing I couldn't grab quickly, maybe you have it already saved, is the link to that dashboard. Is it publicly available? Um, oh, yeah, I can look at it. Um, I, I don't think I have it right right now, but I can put it in the e like email it to everyone sure. if that works. Okay. Yeah. If you want to just send it to me, I'm going to email everybody and tell, tell them that the recording's up. So um, yeah, we'll do that. we can put it in there for sure. Um, all right. And then if you do want to help us, I'll, I'll put out another call to our master naturalist list. Um, some folks already told me that they, they want to help again, but um, if, if you're new to this project, and um, we are going to organize a, a training probably in April. We'll figure out who's interested, and then we'll probably figure out a place to do it where it's convenient for most folks that, that want to participate. Um, if you already participated, you don't necessarily need to come to that workshop again, but if you want to, you'd be welcome to. So we'll just let you know where, when that's going to be. And um, then pretty soon after that, in early April, we'll try to assign the traps to folks like we did last year. We used kind of a rudimentary spreadsheet system where people just kind of signed up for the, the traps they wanted and the days that they wanted throughout the whole 30, how many weeks is it? 29 weeks? We, uh, well, last year it was 23, I think, 23. or 24, but yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Laura, yeah. Did you see Don's question? I do see it. Yeah. Okay. Don says, <laughs> why are we doing this in Phoenix when we have no native pine trees? Allie, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer yeah, that, well, that's actually uh, why we're doing it in Phoenix is because we don't have those native pine trees. Um, so the a Mediterranean pine engraver is a non-native invasive that does prefer our non-native planted Mediterranean pines. So that's why we're doing the trapping is to see how severe the infestation is and how widespread they are throughout the valley, which based off of the trapping from the last few years, they are very widespread, which means, you know, at least in the Phoenix metro um, our, our Mediterranean pines are, are very susceptible to, to the Mediterranean pine engraver. Does that answer your question, Don? Or are you angling at, well, why do we care if they're destroying non-native? Oh, trees? why do we care? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You can type it if you want, or you can, you can unmute yourself if you're able to say it. Um, yes, that was your question. Why do we care? Well, I think it's it's definitely the risk question because they are very big trees, uh, kind of like Pete was also describing. It, they're there, they're in place, right? They maybe do need to be removed, but it's really expensive to take down a very big tree. So there's a lot of homeowners or neighborhood associations that have these trees now on their property that were planted 50, 60 years ago because that was just kind of the thing that was in vogue to plant. We Here in Tucson, there was there's paperwork that demonstrates that they were giving away those pine seedlings uh, to people at gas stations to plant them because they wanted to green up the space, right? And now we know a lot better. We know a lot more that those aren't necessarily the things that we should be planting in our, our neighborhoods for a lot of reasons because they are getting stressed. The climate is changing. It's getting warmer and it's just harder to maintain. So um, the fact that it does pose a risk to people that have those on their property is important to know. Um, if, and if there's a way that they can kind of turn that around to stop that tree from falling on their house or falling on their car, or falling on that person, then um, we want to make sure that people are aware that they should be watering their trees and caring for them, even though it is expensive. But um, taking them down is also an option. Um, and I'm sure Pete will tell you that it is quite an expense to take down an 85, 90, 100 foot tree. <laughs> it's not easy to do, especially in the city. So um, yeah, so that's why that's why we care, and that's why we want to let people know that this is an issue. But you should plant native trees in in place. That's the ones that are desert adapted are better. 
So, so thanks for answering my question, but the, the other part of it, uh, I'll just ask you, sure. is, yeah. does this help prevent that, uh, the, the beetle from bridging to the next community over, uh, at, at, like to Flagstaff or, or something and, and starting anew there or reinforcing if it's already in Flagstaff, for example? Yeah, and, and so, you know, part of this is is just that continuing monitoring so that we can provide, you know, those uh, updates for folks, you know, like we did with Tucson this year, you know, we have done the previous trapping and we knew that we weren't, we weren't finding any MPE until this year. And so that really allowed us to kind of, you know, put the hammer down and make sure people really realize what the risks are now that that's present. And since we know that it's in Tucson and we know that it's in Phoenix, you know, that's part of that outreach and education is what are some of the other communities around us that could be susceptible to MPE? Do we need to trap there? Um, you know, do we need to do more outreach and education in these places so that they're aware of the risks that MPE poses to their non-native pines? Um, so that's definitely part of it is, again, that that kind of communication, education and outreach part, you know, making sure that what we are seeing in Phoenix and Tucson is being relayed to these other areas that they're aware of the issue as well. So where is the next closest geographical area where the beetle is present? Other than Phoenix and Tucson, I believe it, it was caught, um, I, I wanna say somewhere on the border, like outside of Kingman, um, so we're pretty sure that it was vectored here on, you know, wood, of, so whether that was firewood or, or who knows what, but it was moved from Nevada into Arizona. So most likely it made the trek from like Las Vegas because MPE is present in Las Vegas. So it probably came Las Vegas through Kingman into Phoenix. And so along that route, um, you know, it being found in somewhere in Kingman, I want to say possibly like one of the Hualapai mountain areas somewhere in there. Um, but again, that trapping was not done consecutively. That was one year to kind of do early detection and figure out where its presence was and then where we wanted to really do um, the actual monitoring program, which you know we did it in Phoenix in, instead. And so it has been found in some other locations, but um, we will be doing a, another type of trapping program next year that will be more widespread throughout the state. Um, it's, a, it's going to be a different trapping program because we're looking for any type of invasive bark beetle or wood borer. So that will be more widespread and you know, looking at more varieties and not just MPE. So we're, we're continuing that early detection. Just now we're looking at other species as well. Okay, very good. So Irene, Allie. Thanks for the presentation this evening. Awesome. Of course. Yes. Anybody else have anything for, for any of us or want to share anything before we sign off? I got one more thing on removals. I was talking with Corey Dolan and she touched on a program that the Department of Forest Management was working on with say I positively ID'd, I went out and to a customer and they have a tree that's been infested. We know it's been infested, whether it's MPEs or boars, we know it's there. We wanna get rid of it. As a community, we wanna help them get rid of it. Is there a program that um, the Department of Forestry is working on to say, okay, this tree is gonna cost, I mean, I've taken them out anywhere up to $14,000 and ain't none of us have 14,000 in the do dollars sitting in the bank to get rid of a tree that's infested with bugs. But we as a community want to help them get rid of it. Can you elaborate on that program or is Yes, so that actually is another program that I manage. So you are referring to our bark beetle reduction cost share program, which is BRICS for short. And uh, what BRICS does is, is just that we help homeowners pay for the removal of actively infested bark beetle trees. And that is any bark beetle and any tree species. Um, the, the stipulations for that, though, is that tree does have to be positively ID'd by a DFFM employee. So one of us has to come look at that tree, positively determine, yes, it does have some kind of a bark beetle attack. 
And then from there, we work with the homeowner to find a contractor. And then we pay that contractor. Um, the DFFM pays the contractor directly for half of that cost. And then the homeowner pays the direct directly to the contractor that other half um, as well. So that is a program that we do have um, available for folks. And because of the biology of the bark beetles, um, you know, like we were talking about, you know, they're more active in the spring and summer. So our BRICS program is actually paused during the spring and summer because we just don't have the staff to be able to keep up with the trees and how quickly they fade and need to be removed. So we only uh, run the program during the fall and winter. So right now that program is paused, but anyone is welcome to sign up for it um, and put, be put on our wait list for the fall and winter. And that wait list is a first come first serve basis. So as soon as someone signs up, you know, if they sign up this month, they would be one of the first few homes that would be visited this fall. Um, so yeah, and I, and I uh, Lori Ann, I can send you uh, the link for the Google form for the wait list too. Yeah, I can put that in the email and I send it out if you want. Oh yeah, you have it too. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> and that can be anywhere in the state, right, Kelly? Yeah, matter. that's that is anywhere in the state, um, and that is geared towards you know private homeowners that you know they maybe only have one acre or a couple of acres, but again, it's to to help with that rapid response. You know, dealing with those trees that are expensive to manage yourself. So trying to help with that cost. I want to thank Allie and Irene for sharing their time and their knowledge with us tonight and our volunteers again for helping us with the project. So please enjoy the fruits of your labor on the dashboard that we will send out <laughs> to you shortly. Um,